Hi, I'm Barb Elam, Associate Director of Visual Media Resources and Study Collection Librarian at Bar Graduate Center. And I'm here with Richard Yell and Joe Upham, founders of New York Experimental Glass Workshop, now Urban Glass, which was once in Manhattan and is now located in Brooklyn, New York. Richard and Joe are here as part of our programming for the online exhibition and publication, Voices in Studio Glass History, Art and Craft, Maker in Place, and the Critical Writings and Photography of Paul Hollister. Glass artist and designer Richard Wilfred Yell earned his BFA in 1974 from the Massachusetts College of Art and Design and his MFA in 1976 from the Rhode Island School of Design, where he studied glass with Dale Chihuly. The following year, Yell co-founded the New York Experimental Glass Workshop, now Urban Glass, in New York City. In 1983, Yell earned an MA in Arts Administration from New York University. Yale led the crafts program, later the product design department at Parsons School of Design from 1986 to 1998, and continued as a faculty member until 2005 when he joined the University of Bridgeport. Yale is director of the Shintaro Akatsu School of Design at Bridgeport and remains on the board of directors at Urban Glass. Yale was also involved in our Voices in Studio Glass project earlier, and a number of excerpts from his interview can be accessed through our site. The other person we are talking to today is Brookline, Massachusetts-based glass artist Joe Upham. Joe first learned scientific glass at Lexington High School near Boston and studied at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design at MIT. Upham is also co-founder of New York Experimental Glass Workshop, where he created the workshop's NEON program in 1979. Joe works as a consultant for glass, neon, lighting, and software, and since 2018 has been designing a world-class glass facility in Jing Dazen, China. Richard and Joe, welcome. Thank you both for being here. My pleasure. Thanks uh, very much for inviting me. And I have to say, it's great to uh, see Joe and have a chance to listen to his stories. Uh, we, between the two of us, we probably know the whole story uh, at the very beginning. Uh, so you, Good idea to invite us together. Thanks so much. Let's start at the beginning. You both went to MassArt. Can you talk about your experiences there and how you became involved in glass? Richard, let's start with you. Yes, uh, uh, it, in high school, it was my uh, dream to go to MassArt. Uh, and once I was accepted, I was a painting major. And it turns out that uh, the painting department was located in a old loft building down the street from uh, the main building and uh, it was very quiet so I'd go over to the main building and the exciting places were the ceramics studio, the sculpture studio, and uh, the studio of interrelated media performances in the auditorium. Uh, that's where I met Joe and uh, I met uh, a bunch of uh, people in the ceramics area and uh, I changed majors. Uh, what really happened is that I also had an interest in uh, technology, uh, as it turns out, uh, because I participated in the ceramics program as the glaze technician and helped uh, with the uh, repairing the, uh, the kilns and firing kilns and just in general trying to make myself useful. And uh, one of the fantastic things about MassArt was uh, the, the head of our area, 3D, uh, uh, Russell Doucette, uh, pretty much never said no. And uh, it was my kind of place. Uh, so I used to go to the sim performances and there was Joe uh, making all of the technology happen. And uh, so that's why I uh, approached him and, and pretty much asked him, what are you doing? <laughs> and uh, so uh, it was very exciting and it was a 24 seven uh, kind of place in the 3D area. Uh, and then uh, there is a young person and Joe can probably talk more about this uh, named Ron Boyko, uh, who actually uh, 
set up a uh, glass furnace, the, the first one in mass arts history. And uh, I didn't participate in that, uh, but I heard about it and looked at it and Joe was involved. And uh, that led to a whole uh, series of uh, things happening, uh, including uh, the ability of the 3D area to hire a, a full-time faculty member in the area of glass. And uh, that turned out to be Dan Daly. And uh, soon after that, uh, Russ Doucette uh, said we could build a glass shop in uh, a shed uh, behind the ceramic area where the kilns were, because uh, there was already gas out there, propane at that time. So uh, it, it was just, uh, you know, like a, a super life experience at MassArt at that time. And of course, Dan Daly uh, made it made a big difference as well. Great, thank you so much, Joe. What do you have to say about those early days? Well, it's it's they were really um, unusually uh, uh, formative for myself as well. And I'm glad that Richard brought up Russ Set because Russ's attitude of just make it. You know, just do it really, I think, is partly responsible for the creation of New York Experimental Glass Workshop is that kind of spirit of let's just make it happen. Uh, and if you have an idea, do it. It, it really uh, was a very, very strong uh, force. And, and um, Richard spoke about uh, the studio for inter interrelated media. And it, it's quite interesting because before Richard was there, I worked for the Studio for Inter Interrelated Media for Harris Barron. The Studio for Interrelated Media was born out of, oddly enough, the ceramics department. Harris was a uh, ceramics student, started doing sculpture, and then uh, his interests progressed. And I think that attitude of let's explore, let's, let's just uh, try some new things led him to media. And that's when I joined uh, Mass Art, working with the Studio for Interrelated Media, and uh, Ron Boyko, who, who Richard mentioned, um, also worked at, at the Studio for Interrelated Media, and he's the one that roped me into the uh, glass project. I had had glass experience in, in high school and was enthralled by the material. And when he said, you know, I, I want to build a furnace to melt glass, I was 100% behind that project and helped him in any way I could. Uh, he, he really did most of it. I, I was just handy for doing wiring and gathering materials together. Um, but uh, really, uh, uh, Russ Doucette was the guy who behind the scenes was cheering us on. And, you know, the uh, good news and bad news in those days was that MassArt didn't have any money. Uh, and so as a result, if you wanted to do something, you had to figure out how to do it without the support of the institution. And that was something that actually was sort of a blessing in disguise because the the, the buildings, uh, when Richard talks about the shed that was there for ceramics, actually students and teachers together got together, raised the money, built that building. Uh, when it was time to expand uh, the glass area, again, it was the students and the teachers together that did fundraisers got the materials together, built the glass shop. Uh, I, you know, I was good with wiring. So actually I ran the, the power out from the, the main building to the ceramic shed and through the ceramic shed to the glass shed. And, and just, you know, again, we had a leadership that was uh, just do your dream. And, and it, 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 it really was so important to have that support. We didn't have somebody standing around saying, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. We had somebody who was saying, yeah, why don't you try to do that? And I think that the existence of Urban Glass really, a lot of it goes back to Russ Doucette and his attitude. And, and I'm really glad to give him a lot of credit for the uh, idea that we can actually do stuff. And and we did. So it was, it was really wonderful when, when Richard and I met, and uh, simultaneously, Richard was involved in, in uh, the search for a uh, glass professor. Dan Daly arrived, 
and Dan had the same attitude. Let's, let's do this. And we spent a lot of time uh, putting pipes together, putting bricks together and, and building a, a glass studio and building a glass, uh, uh, glass program that really uh, uh, obviously is still a, a strong part of mass art today. But in that process of building, we learned so much that we didn't realize what we were learning when, when we learned it. But we were learning that, yes, we could actually, uh, if we wanted to, do uh, New York Experimental Glass Workshop. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Joe, another question. Um, what drew you to neon specifically? And were there neon fabricators in New York when you finally arrived? I actually began my interest in neon in high school because I, I had a very advanced physics class where, where we built a uh, gas laser and in, in the process discovered all the uh, aspects of, of glass working and physics uh, that went along with that. And that's where my first glass working experience was in, in, in high school. So at, at MIT, I, I furthered that uh, understanding. Uh, to be clear, I, I, I wasn't enrolled as a student at, at MIT's official day pr program. I was, I was in, in the, the night school, but certainly working there at MIT. Um, I did classes at, at uh, the Center for Eventual Studies with Otto Pina and Alejandro Sina, who are, who are my teachers, and those were part of the, the exchange program between MassArt and MIT. And um, in those days, neon was uh, sort of a dying art and uh, a little bit mysterious. And so I was very lucky that I, I uh, ran into people who were, who were interested and experienced. Alejandro and Otto brought the class to Harold Ed Edgerton's um, studios to his lab and uh edgerton of course was very uh instrumental in in uh strobe lights and i was also interested in strobe lights so it was it was kind of a magic place um and his power supplies for triggering strobe lights were easily adapted by alejandro for powering neon so i worked with with alejandro and uh, uh we had sort of been following parallel paths, and Alejandro was was uh, you know way ahead of me. But it was it was really great for me to understand that yeah I, I knew what he was doing, and and uh, you know when when we were visiting at, at Edgerton, it was clear that this was all going back to his his work. And um, so I I when I came to New York, I was kind of uh, surprised to find Rudy Stern was was uh, a, a giant. Uh, a proponent of neon and had a store, I think it was virtually the only storefront on West Broadway at the time where he was selling neon. And the neon he was involved in was fairly commercial and, and not terribly artistic in my uh, assessment, but he was certainly an, an incredibly important person in the rebirth of, of neon in, in, in New York and pushing neon as, as a material to be used by artists. So um, yeah, when I, when I first arrived in, in New York, I, I felt as though there was a lot to be done with neon, but in those days there weren't uh, a, a lot of uh, artists experimenting with unusual uses of, of, of neon. So um, yeah, I was happy to, to set up a, a studio for, for teaching neon and uh, for better or worse, the first studio was uh, my my living room um, at, at the back studio of, of Great Jones Street. The glass shop was in the basement and I was living uh, on the first floor in, in the rear of the gallery and uh, I had set up a neon area for myself and one evening for dinner, Richard pointed to all the neon stuff and said, gee, you know, we could teach neon. And, and I thought, great idea. And then I thought, oh, what did I just say? Because I knew that the only place to teach it would be my living space or my studio space. So it, it changed the way my involvement was with, with, with uh, New York Experimental in those days. But it was really such a, a high energy time that 
again, the attitude was no one should say no, let's just do do this. And and there's so much positive energy. Uh, it, it was really quite, quite wonderful. Great, thank you. Richard, um, you went on to RISD and then moved to New York and sort of famously decided to reject Dale Chihuly's offer to help build Pilchuck in the early 70s. Instead, you came to New York fairly soon after that. And I was wondering, what was your inspiration for New York Experimental Glass Workshop? Well, I have to um, uh, give uh, Dan Daly a lot of credit because uh, uh, he had just graduated from RISD Glass Program uh, then spent a year on a Fulbright in Venice. And he just, when he came back, he came directly to Mass Art. And uh, he was a very interesting person, uh, you know, world experience, knew a lot about glass. I, I went down to RISD to meet Dale. Uh, I actually showed Dale a photograph of the glass shop that we had just finished building at Mass Art, and I think that's part of part of the reason that I got accepted. Uh, but I went on at RISD, of course, uh, uh, as a teaching assistant and taught classes in stained glass and helped uh, rebuild the studio as needed uh, at RISD and. Uh, I have to say that I I I loved it at, at uh, in Providence at RISD. It was a really interesting, exciting place, and of course, it was next door to the ceramics area, uh, which is uh, how I ended up uh, getting to know June Kaniko uh, and Norm Schulman, who was the chair of uh, ceramics there, very well. And then uh, Dan had been living in a carriage house on College Hill in Providence. And uh, when he vacated, he offered it to me. So I lived on the ground floor of a carriage house with Susan Kay, my girlfriend uh, from Mass Art. And uh, June Kaniko and Fumi lived upstairs. And so I got to know them uh, pretty well and uh, it was uh, he, uh, June Kaneko, as you probably all know, he's a fantastic artist and uh, sculptor, ceramist, uh, just an amazing uh, guy. But uh, Susan and I went to New York City uh, the summer between my two years at RISD and we worked for a uh, display company uh, called Decorative Plant. I had learned in my research while at RISD that Andy Warhol had actually, that was one of his first jobs in New York City was in the display area. Uh, so I was all for it. And uh, of course, uh, I, we had a uh, invite because Susan's father owned, uh, was one of the owners of Decorative Plant. And uh, li we lived in uh, Washington Square in a sublet. And uh, New York City just, uh, I just loved it. And I, I couldn't get enough of it. And I wanted to go back even before I uh, left that summer. So it was really on my mind, but uh, uh, to be really uh, clear, um, uh, I think it was uh, Jamie he, uh, Carpenter, he, he showed me some photographs of uh, Pilchuk. And uh, there was a photograph of him sleeping on the ground next to a tree stump. And, uh, <laughs> and I thought of living in a nice apartment in, on Washington Square. And uh, the choice turned out to uh, be pretty easy. And Susan and I uh, left Providence and, and went to New York City uh, permanently. And uh, uh, 
stayed in Queens for a while, but uh, got a loft uh, on Franklin Street, uh, which is where uh, the New York Experimental Glass Workshop really got started. And to answer your question specifically, uh, during my uh, year in New York City between uh, RISD and, and the glass workshop, I explored uh, the glass scene in New York City and went uh, and met everybody that I could. And uh, Joe's right about Rudy Stern and his, his shop called Let There Be Neon. Uh, but uh, I also met a lot of people in the architectural uh, stained glass area. And there was a famous studio on 13th Street called Rambush Studio. And then I uh, took a class at Pars uh, Parsons School of Design, the new school, evening class in stained glass. That's where I met Eric Erickson. Um, Eric was older uh, and had a lot more experience. He was a member of a uh, world traveling dance troupe. And he uh, had, he, he knew uh, people in the glass, then uh, New York City glass world, uh, including a incredible glass painter named Albinus Elskis, who uh, really uh, it, it inspired me. Uh, and then uh, to my luck, I uh, met Rose uh, Slivka, uh, then editor of Craft Horizons. And uh, she introduced me to Claywork Studio Workshop. And uh, it was, uh, that was the beginning of uh, doing <laughs> things that we had no idea what we were doing. It sure was a lot of fun. Um, Richard, just to follow up on that, when uh, you talked a little bit just now about Clayworks on Great Jones Street, when you saw Clayworks, what what interested in you in that location specifically? Well, uh, it was at Four Great Jones Street, which is actually um, a pretty ritzy place nowadays. But in those days, uh, being only a block from the the Bowery. Uh, it was a pretty rough neighborhood, but Clayworks was really well uh, set up and and situation situated. It's uh, a good location, right close to Washington Square Park. They had a gallery, they had a living quarters, uh, they had a large uh, work area. Uh, they had a very small office, uh, and then they had a loft in the back, which is what Joe referred to earlier. And in the basement, they had a full um, ceramic studio. But what really uh, inspired me about Clayworks was their gallery and visiting artists program uh, was just, uh, I was just almost stunned to see it all happening under one roof. Uh, and uh, there were such interesting people there. And the premise of Clayworks is to put a ceramic artist together with a fine artist and uh, help the fine artists produce a body of work in ceramics, uh, essentially to promote the use of materials and the fine arts world in New York City. So uh, it, it was, um, I've never, never, I had never seen anything like Clayworks before. It was a new experience. Very interesting, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Joe, I understand you brought a portable furnace to New York um, to set up uh, the first studio. 
Um, could you describe what that is for our viewers? Did you build it yourself? What size was it? Things like that. Yeah, I, I, uh, uh, I think the, the experience of building uh, equipment for the studio at, at uh, Mass Art with Richard, uh, you know, enabled me to create uh, my own equipment. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be building a furnace, let's build something where I can share the, the glass experience with other people. So when, when I started building equipment for my own studio, I, I, I built it to be uh, on the small side and portable so I could load it into a U-Haul trailer and bring it to uh, craft fairs in those days. There were uh, quite a few different outdoor craft fairs in the Boston area. Uh, the biggest one was at the, the Quarterly Museum, which of course is a very interesting history with glass already. So they, they were really happy to have me come and do glass blowing demos there. But uh, the, the furnace was built out of, uh, you know, high tech equipment that was developed for the um, uh, space, space program, lightweight insulation, uh, I used as little um, hard brick as possible, which uh, of course I found out that um, having thin liner means your furnace wears out very quickly, but the, the, that was the bad news. The good news was that um, poor people could pick this furnace up and, and carry it and put it anywhere. Um, so I, I had built this, this equipment, Richard knew about it, and um, when, when Richard was visiting Clayworks, he, he noticed the uh, uh, ceramic kiln there and understood that they already had uh, gas, they had ventilation, they had the basic ingredients for uh, uh, installing a glass studio. It was already there at, at, at Clayworks. And um, then he was taking this class with, with uh, uh, Eric Erickson and, and uh, it seemed uh, there was this repeating pattern every, um, I think, was it a Tuesday evening, your, your class? Uh, after I class, so, I think it was a Tuesday. I don't know. Anyhow, after class, he, he would go have a beer with Eric and, and they'd say, yeah, let's, let's, let's uh, uh, have a glass studio. And then Richard would, would call me and, and say, hey, Joe, Let's let's uh, uh, bring your furnace down to New York and and you know I think the first time he called me it was kind of late and he woke me up and, and I was like Richard what are you talking about I'm asleep and I just hung up on him and then uh, he kept calling me and and eventually he invited me down and and um, I I really relate to what Richard was saying when he spent that summer in New York. Uh, with, with Susan, there, there's an energy in New York that is kind of magical. And in those days, it really was a little bit of the Wild West, um, but it, it, it was a very energetic, and very creative place. And once he got me down there and I saw what New York uh, was like, and I saw the potential of, of putting a furnace there at, at Clayworks, it was really hard to uh, resist. So, um, you know, he, he convinced me that it was a good idea. I, I loaded everything in the U-Haul trailer and brought it to New York. Great. That's great. Um, Joe, could you also talk about your living situation in New York City in the early days? I understand when you lived at Clayworks, there was a fire just around the time <laughs> that you were moving in. Could you talk about just the risks you took living and working in those days in New York? Well, I, I didn't have that much more risk than anyone else. I think all of the artists that were living in lofts had various uh, uh, dramas involved. And it was just sort of a really bad coincidence that when we moved the furnace into Clayworks, they were firing the kiln and the person who was firing the kiln wasn't very uh, attentive and went off to do some other things and left the kiln in, in, in reduction. And, and I, I think I had brought the kiln down, but I wasn't actually living in the studio in the, in the back of Ray Jones Street yet. But uh, the furnace was there right next to the kiln. The technician at, at Clayworks 
put the kiln in reduction, which just means that the, there's a, an absence of, of oxygen, reduced oxygen. So there, there was uh, flames shooting out of the top of the kiln. Um, of course, there was a hood to catch the flames, but uh, I, I think what happened is, is the hood wasn't very well installed so that there, there, the beams next to the stack actually got overheated and started to smolder. Uh, neighbors called the fire department because they saw flames shooting out of this uh, stack coming out of the building and the fire department came and proceeded to, to put the kiln out, which basically uh, in order to do that, they climbed on top of the glass furnace, broke the crown of, of the furnace in the process, and put a fire hose in the, in the top of the kiln and, and uh, basically destroyed most of the work in, in the kiln in the process. So it was, it was kind of uh, starting things off with a, with a big disaster. And, and I think most of the hardship of living in New York was just dealing with how uh, sort of uncivilized that area of New York was. I mean, it, 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 Great Jones Street now is really nice, and now it's referred to as Nolita uh, because it's north of Little Italy. And in those days, it was called NoHo. And the inside joke was, you know, Soho was somewhere, but NoHo was nowhere. And and we really were in a, in a you know, it was kind of a dangerous area. There were there were a lot of people. Um, uh, all over the place doing things that they probably shouldn't be doing. And I guess the, the bad news was a little dangerous. The good news was that there was a lot of uh, freedom and not a lot of monitoring of what was going on. And the environment was, uh, yeah, I think I mentioned before, it was a little bit like the, the Wild West, but it was... Uh, the, the wild north of, of, of uh, Houston, wild no-ho. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, the first glass blowing demonstration in New York City was conducted by Harvey Littleton at the First World Congress of Craftsmen in 1964. Richard, you talked about how you and Joe did a public demonstration in 1978 for the New York State Craftsmen's Organization at the Coliseum in Columbus Circle, and later for Channel 13 Arts and Antiques Auction. This was the first public demonstration in Manhattan since the 1964 demo. Richard, could you talk a little bit more about it? Yes, uh, the, um, the demo uh, at the Coliseum was arranged by Harry Dennis, who was then uh, director of the New York State Craftsman. And uh, he, he told uh, me and Joe that we had been uh, partially funded by the Corning uh, Glass Foundation. So that in itself was a lot of exciting news that we had actually, somebody actually uh, uh, thought we were interesting enough to actually, actually uh, provide some funding. Uh, the Coliseum, as you can imagine, was uh, New York City's convention center. And eventually it, in Columbus Circle, uh, eventually, uh, as everybody knows, it was torn down and uh, the Javik Center was built. But then it was the center of uh, trade shows and uh, art shows and craft shows. Uh, and it was a real experience for me and Joe uh, because the Coliseum was uh, unionized and uh, we actually had to uh, get Joe's furnace out of the U-Haul trailer and into the building and set up. And then uh, Joe had to figure out how to get the thing hot enough to melt glass. But it, it actually turned out uh, really well. And I, I think we all had a good time. Uh, sometime after that, we were invited uh, by Channel 13 to do a live demonstration on a soundstage for their first uh, arts and antique auction. And um, that was another one of those, uh, our, well, I should say our second U-Haul adventure because we had to get uh, the furnace into the studio and, and set up 
And then Joe had to actually get it hot enough to melt glass. And uh, <laughs> we have to ask him uh, how he did that because that's that really is a great story. But uh, j just uh, so you know, I think how well it went is that some of uh, the uh, glass work that Joe made live on stage was uh, actually auctioned off right there and then while he was making it. Uh, so um, with that, I uh, want to turn <laughs> it over to Joe. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I remember uh, pretty well having Richard lean over and say, hey, Joe, no pressure, but the bidding on that goblet you're making is up to $2,000, so don't break it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but the the uh, problem with, with uh, this soundstage where Channel 13 um, was holding the auction was, was that the fire marshal wouldn't allow propane in the building, and we were told that there wouldn't be any problem getting gas for powering the furnace. However, uh, what they considered gas was basically a burns o uh, cylinder that would, would power a plumber's torch. And um, one of those attached to a furnace would, would last for about 30 seconds. So um, we, we had to negotiate with them and, and they eventually allowed us to use what you'd, uh, a tank that you'd use on a backyard for a bar barbecue, uh, a 20 pound propane tank. Uh, even one of those tanks only lasted for about 20 minutes. So we had to keep changing those tanks. But the, the, the first time we turned it on, uh, the furnace ran for, for about four minutes and then it shut off and, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And then I, I, I checked the tank and it was totally covered in frost. And I realized the, the, the propane uh, was evaporating so fast that it had all frozen solid. So um, I was asking some some of the lighting guys at Channel 13 if if they had any heaters that we could heat the tank up to to keep the propane va va vaporized. And this guy uh, looked at me and said, "Geez, we don't have any heaters, but maybe you can use one of these 10 kilowatt uh, spotlights." And uh, so we aimed a 10 kilowatt spotlight at the propane tank behind uh, the curtains, and that kept the propane va va vaporizing long enough to run one one 20 minute segment where we'd blow glass and then would change to a new tank so it was really a Rube Goldberg arrangement and it was only through uh, basically a fire marshal that bent the rules a little bit and a, and a lighting tech at channel 13 who was uh, a little bit creative and and uh, interesting that we were able to actually pull it off but it was it was a very unique uh, thing I don't think anyone has brought a glass furnace into a TV studio to uh, to blow glass since usually they bring the TV studio to the glass furnace right, right. wow that's incredible very very cool thank you so much to both of you um, we're here with Joe Upham and Richard Yell of New York Experimental Glass Workshop now Urban Glass for more information about Richard and about Joe, please see our Voices of Studio Glass History Digital Project on the Bar Graduate Center website. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Barb. Thank you.